We're in this series um, that I have called Building Back Boulder, and we are in the book of Nehemiah. I may have to kind of get organized here a little bit, and uh, that'll take me just a minute. I forgot my pad. (laughs) How many of you are glad when God moves in and starts healing people? Amen. Amen. Let me uh, just say a little bit about this. I woke up on Friday morning with no voice, so I called for prayer. First thing you do, right? And then I called the doctor, and so I've been on antibiotics and prednisone and stuff like that. But I have to tell you that when I get sick like that, um, I'm reassured it must be a really important message. Now, I know I'm not saying it's a good message, because a good message you might think was something that's really funny or, or, or stirs you up or something like that, but I think it's an important message uh, because there's probably something uh, here for you that you need to hear and apply in your life, and, and for all of us, I know for me. Uh, so we sort of have that endorsement. Um, Nehemiah is at a time of rebuilding, rebuilding and so I want to kind of context that a little bit. Um, rebuilding from What? The story really begins with destruction. Uh, in, the, in the next slide, in 586 BC, Jerusalem is destroyed. This is a big deal. The city of David, uh, Solomon's temple, a wonder of the ancient world reduced to rubble, the city of the great king, uh, the city of Zion. I mean, it was the place that everything had been moving toward for a thousand years is destroyed, reduced to rubble. And Nehemiah uh, is about a rebuilding that happens after that. It occurred to me, I was just kind of thinking about this this week, that if uh, it's a judgment, and if God would judge Israel in this way, after a thousand years of work, uh, would judge Israel in this way, um, and, and Israel is the apple of his eye, we should not think that we would be immune in, in our day and time from judgment. We need to know that. That's why revival is so important. Revival isn't just this thing that happens someplace that is kind of stirring things up. Uh, And we're hearing about that. Um, It began in the northern kingdom called Israel. And uh, there was a scattering of the ten northern tribes, the north. Then the south uh, was uh, reduced uh, to rubble finally by uh, Babylon. And there was the exile of everybody that was left there to Babylon And that's in 586. This is the destruction that we're talking about. When you hear the term Babylonian exile, this is what it's about. So about 50 years later, God orchestrated the return of uh, people from exile. And it happened in three waves. First, Zerubbabel uh, led 50,000 on a little retreat. Can you imagine? (laughs) And their goal, rebuild the temple. We've got to rebuild the temple. And it's called the second temple It's the temple that was there all the way until the time of Jesus. Then Ezra brought about 5,000 more to rebuild what goes on inside the temple, the worship and the honoring of God's word. Uh, It it wasn't right. And so he's rebuilding that. And now Nehemiah, a little bit later, comes. And that's where we are in this story. Uh, He brought probably 500 or less to rebuild the walls and create security. So uh, We're in Nehemiah chapter 6, and the walls um, of Jerusalem are getting close to being finished. Uh, We've seen progress all the way along in the last chapter. Um, But Nehemiah, he had overcome opposition from the outside and from every direction. We've been seeing that. Sambalot, Tobiah, and Geshem are the three uh, musketeers or the three stooges, I guess, um, that keep coming against him. Really, that's a better term. Um, And Nehemiah had settled strife and division from the inside. He's an amazing leader. And there was now this renewed commitment um, to to rebuild. Uh, So the walls have been rebuilt to about halfway. Last chapter, we were about halfway, and we're going to see a lot of progress in chapter 6. Nehemiah was pressing into the task, and uh, the enemies had still not gone away. They're still hanging around. So uh, we're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 6, and I'm going to invite Pastor Ann to come and to read the scripture uh, to just give my my voice a little bit of a break. And uh, so I invite you to uh, look 
Uh, it'll be on the screen, but also the Bible's out there on page 401, I think. And if you don't own a Bible, change that. You need to own a Bible, receive that Bible. If you don't own one, receive it as a gift from uh, your church family here at Faith Fellowship Church. I'm so glad you explained that a little bit because chapter six is very complicated and it's filled with a bunch of funny and unusual names. And I don't want you to get distracted from that. For me, when I read a chapter of the Bible, it helps me to know what I'm heading into. And that's what you were just sharing. It, their victory is almost theirs. And the enemy is going to try one last time to try to distract and discourage and stop the event from happening, the project of God. And so as you're listening to this, please think about the, the ways the enemy tried to send rumors, deceit, and false reports against Nehemiah and how Nehemiah combated them. And how he kept going. Chapter 6 has some of the most underlined scriptures in my Bible. I don't know about you, but I hope you brought your Bible today. So you can underline some of these and take them home and apply them to your life. So here we go. Um, in the NIV, the title of this says, Further Opposition to the Building or the Rebuilding. And here we go in Nehemiah 6. Now when Sambalot and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab... And the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set up the doors in the gates. Sambalot and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come and let us meet together at Hakashbirim in the plain of Ono. But they intended to do me harm. And I sent messengers to them, saying, I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way, and I answered them in the same manner. In the same way, Sambalat, for the fifth time, sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. In it was written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. That is why you are building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. And you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem, there is a king of in Judah. And now the king will hear of these reports. So now come and let us take counsel together. Then I sent to him saying, no such thing as you say has been done for you are inventing them out of your own mind. For they all wanted to frighten us thinking their hands will drop from the work and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. Now, when I went into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, son of Mehetabel, who was confined to his home, he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. But I said, should such a man as I run away? And what man such as I could go into the temple and live? I will not go in. And I understood and saw that God had not sent him, but he had pronounced the prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambalot had hired him. For this purpose he was hired, that I should be afraid and act in this way and sin so they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. Remember Tobiah and Sambalot, oh my God, according to these things that they did. And also the prophetess Noadiah, 
and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month Ulul in 52 days. And when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their esteem, for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Arah, and his son, Johanan, had taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, as his wife. Also, they spoke of his good deeds in my presence and reported my words to him. And Tobiah sent letters to make me afraid. Will you pray with me? Would you stand as we honor those, the reading of God's word? And would you mind reaching your hands out toward Pastor Jeff and asking um, the Lord to help him make it through this? Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for how something that happened so long ago can help us in our daily life. And we pray right now that you'll open our hearts and our minds, give us new revelation that we might understand the power of your words, of a statement, of a thought, of a completed assignment for ourselves, Lord, in this year, in this day. And we pray, Lord Jesus, for our pastor, Pastor Jeff, Lord, that you would use his voice. When he is weak, you will be strong, that you will give his vocal cords the ability to present so that the people of God can hear the good news that we can be a changed people, different than when we walked in the door today, equipped for battle, ready to continue on fighting a good fight, finishing the race, doing what you have assigned to each one of us to do. We love you, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit, and be our teacher. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All those hard names, and you pronounced them confidently. That's the way to do it. So we're at this point where progress on the, on the walls uh, was really moving fast. This was an incredible construction project, as we're going to see. Uh, but uh, there was still some opposition. And we see that Sambalat, Tobiah, and Geshem the Arab, um, they're, they're seeing that this is going on and seeing that now the walls are... When we get to chapter 6, there's no breach. The walls are, are just done. The gates still need to be put in place. That's not much that is left. And so I call this the plot thickens because there's a lot of plotting that goes on here. But the enemy continues to attack with what I'm going to call three sneaky plots. This is all about sneakiness. We have a, a friend that some of you know, Dr. Jackson Downey, uh, that we've known for years and years. He's done a lot of mission work in Cameroon in, in Africa, and uh, he's fond of saying, uh, the devil is a really sneaky dude, <clears throat> and I think that's very, very true. The first that we see is, I'm going to call it the frenemy trap, um, and I, you know, I had heard that word. I thought it was just a millennial word that, that came up. <laughs> it was just a popular thing. It actually um, has been in circulation since about 1953 during the Cold War, but it's a person who pretends to be your friend, but is, in fact, an enemy. It's a really important thing for us to be aware of. This is a friendly uh, message of peace that came from Sambalot and Geshem. And it appeared to be an invitation to a peace conference. Come and let us, let us meet together at this place that's hard to pronounce, Hakefirim, uh, in, the, in the plain of Ono. Well, where is that? This is a guy from Persia, by the way. You know, I mean, this is where he's grown up. So, uh, so we need to know a little bit more about that. Hakefarim is in the plain of Ono. Just to be clear, this Ono is not related at all to Yoko. Okay. Um, I, if you have to explain, find somebody from the 70s. Okay. <laughs> all right. So, um, 
But it's 25 miles to the northwest of Jerusalem. It's really in the, what we call the Jezreel Valley, where all, a lot of wars took place. Um, it's uh, six miles away from Joppa, which would be modern Tel Aviv. Um, and it's, it's a, just a village out there, kind of in the middle of nowhere. And on the surface, it appeared that Sambalot and Geshem wanted to have this peace conference. But Nehemiah was suspicious, <laughs> of course. Are you suspicious of this invitation? Yes, it should be stronger than that. All right. So when we engage the text, we have to kind of think about the questions that would go on. And there's a few questions here. Uh, why would they want him a day's journey away from Jerusalem? Say, hmm. You can even go like this. This is what I do. Hmm. Uh, okay. Uh, why would they want him to be near the border of Samaria, way up there toward the, just right, look at right there. You can see the red line. That's Samaria. That's Sambalot there. Let's do it again. Hmm. And then why would they want him close to Gaza in the south where Geshem and his forces were? Okay, let's give a strong one. Hmm. <laughs> and so if you look at the map, any military person would look at this and they would say, oh, it's a, it's a perfect trap. It's a pincer movement that, the, that can be planned from there. I think that's the next click. There we go. <laughs> And if you have done any military stuff, you know, yeah, that's what you plan for, to come from two directions, trap your enemy, and get them out there in the middle of a plane, in the place they can't defend themselves. Um, Nehemiah was in Jerusalem, which was a fortress city. It's the highest place in the area, uh, and the walls are getting built. That's what they were afraid of. So he's suspicious of this. They may have thought, this guy's he's just a cupbearer. He's a new, he, hasn't, he doesn't even know the land. He hasn't been around. He hasn't gone on a tour of Israel with the Hoys or anything like that. Okay? <laughs> so he doesn't, know, he doesn't know the terrain. He doesn't know the territory. And, uh, but apparently he, he knew something because he says, they intended me harm. That, that's what this, he, he recognizes. Now, how did he really know this? He may have had his sources. He may have had, some, he may have had his own sources and spies. They call them assets. Uh, he may have had that. More important, he had God. If you've got God, you don't even need spies. God knows everything. And if you listen to God, God will let you know what's really going on. Sometimes he'll let you know. You go, no, that can't be. Yeah, you need to listen to God. If you listen to God, he will keep you from harm. Psalm 91.3 says, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. Let's read that out loud. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. We need to know that. I mean, that's just one. There are so many places that he says something like that. So Nehemiah has an answer. He says, I'm busy. I love the way he says this. This is such a powerful thing. I mean, he doesn't even like weigh it out. He says, I am doing a great work. I cannot come down. I'm doing a great work. I cannot come down. Why should I stop and leave and come down to you? Now, he could have confronted them and said, Are you, you think I'm stupid? You know, I, I can see you're trying to set a trap. He didn't want to do that. He doesn't want to start a war. He did not come to start a war. But, but he recognizes this. Four times they come back, and the scripture says each time he, he answers in the same way. I'm doing a great work. I cannot come down. Sometimes we need to remember that, that there are many good things that will try to distract us from the great thing that God has appointed for you. We get a lot of invitations. We get a lot of things pulling on us. You know, I, I, I can't tell you how many times I'll get a call, and it's an hour before these services start. Hey, Pastor Jeff, can I talk to you? And I, I always try to answer, you know, I, I recognize the number, yeah. And I, they say, can I talk to you? I really need to talk to you. And I say, well, what's it about? And, and, and they may say, well, I've got a big decision that I'm making this week. And I say, could we, could we talk on Wednesday? Oh, yeah, that would be fine. You see, an hour before this, this is a big thing, and I can't come down from this, okay? But I will be with you, and I hope that doesn't sound rude, but that's the way we need to handle the things of God and weigh some of our priorities. So we've got to watch out. And we've got to watch out for frenemies uh, because they act like friends, but they're really enemies. 
The second ploy was a slander trap. A fifth messenger comes, fifth time, from Sambalot. He's got an open, unsealed letter. I'll explain a little bit about that. And here's what it says. It's talking about the rumors that are going around. We've heard some rumors. It's reported among the nations. Exactly where? What are your sources? And Geshem. Geshem also said it. He's the guy in the south. That you and the Jews intend to rebel against Artaxerxes. Uh, That is why you're building the wall. You're intending to rebel. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. We don't believe that, but that's, that's just the rumors that are going around. And you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem, there is a king in Judah. And now the king, King Artaxerxes, will hear these reports. So, so now come and let us take counsel together. Won't you come out here in this field? Yeah, way away from all of your support and all of your strength. Won't you come out, please, please? Come meet with us. This is a sneaky letter because of the way it arrived. An open, unsealed letter. It's hard to even understand what that means. But the contents then were spread all about. It would be like a group text, <laughs> or an open post, or an open letter. They didn't have newspapers, they didn't have, have media, but uh, people were hungry for, for news, so they would, they would hear about this. This would spread like wildfire. There, the rumors are, rumors are that they're going to have a rebellion and, and they're going to make Nehemiah the king. And, and it may seem as though Sambalot and, and, and had Nehemiah's welfare at heart, but we know that's not true. And we need to realize, and we'll get to this a little bit in application, but um, sometimes there are people who say, I'm just concerned about you, and they're not. You know, and sometimes it, you, know, you, you can pick up on it. You know, there's rumors that people are going to be laid off I, you know, at work, and I think you might be on the list. I, I, don't, I don't believe it, you know. Things that put fear into you. Sometimes a friend of me will, will bring something like that, and the king has heard about this. It looks really bad. So, so let's go out to the trapping place out here and take counsel. That's pretty sneaky. So you have to be careful of frenemy manipulation. It, it can often involve rumors and slander. It gets us paranoid. It gets us fearful. The enemy always uses fear. It's one of his main tools. When, when, instead of trusting God, just believe the fears. And, uh, and this is the sort of thing that can come up. Um, there was a fear that Artaxerxes would lower the boom on this project uh, because this was a big deal. He had, he had moved a lot of resources. So Nehemiah rejected this whole thing, this whole rumor thing. No such thing as you say have been done. No such things as, as you say have been done. This is not it. You're inventing this out of your own mind, okay? For all they wanted, he makes a statement about them, all they wanted to do is frighten us. He picks up on it. Uh, so that their hands will, will drop from the work and it will not be done. And so his response now, Nehemiah, I, I just admire this leader more and more. He says, not going to happen, not going to quit. I didn't come all the way from Persia to get almost done and then quit because of some stupid rumors. Amen? Yeah. And so he says, then he, he immediately goes to prayer. I love this about Nehemiah. He'll just start praying. And his prayer is, but now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. They want to make my hands weak. Strengthen my hands. Very, very powerful prayer. You know, I'll just, a little aside. Some of you know that I, um, I've played Tevya in Fiddler on the Roof twice. And both times I was weak. The first time because I had had a stent put in six days before it opened. And, uh, and, and I was stomping around on stage and the cardiologists were there I think it got them praying even. Um, and then the second time I had something like this, a vocal problem. And every single show before I opened with the big opening monologue, I just said, Jesus, I can't do this. I, my voice would be about like this. I've got to sing this two and a half hour show and I can't do it. Jesus, give me what I need. I, played that, I prayed that same prayer last night. I prayed that same prayer this morning. Sometimes when we are weak, then he can be strong. And we just have to not quit. Um, so we, we see him rejecting these things and then praying. The third plot, I'm going to call the insider trap. The enemies hired a man named Shemaiah uh, to propose a solution to Nehemiah. 
Now, Shemaiah, he was an insider. Uh, he was respected in some way because he, he was apparently a prophet. He was known, apparently, to be a prophet. He had locked himself in his house, which seems kind of weird to me. He probably locked himself in saying, I have to stay holy. I can't be around you because I can't have any defilement if I'm going to be a prophet of God. And so I'm going to be really holy and I'll be over here. So don't come around and I'll stay inside the house. I suspect that he didn't want to work on the wall. Now, that's not in the scripture. That's Pastor Jeff. He's a, a, but I mean, I, we know he's not a prophet from what we see in the story in the next few. I, mean, I, th- I think he could have been a slacker. Um, Nehemiah must have trusted Shemaiah because he came to meet with him in his house. He said, okay, I'll come. You've called for me to come and meet you in the house. So he comes. And Shemaiah says, hey, you know, I don't think it's safe here. Uh, let's go meet inside the temple. Let's, let's, let's meet together inside the house of God within the temple. And we'll, we can go in there. We'll close the doors of the temple. Now, let me just explain what that means. It's not out in the courts. It's not out in the places where everybody can go. It's in the place, the holy place. Probably not the holy of holies, but we can go inside there, close the doors, and we'll be in there. We'll be safe in the holy place. And, and why? Because they're coming to kill you. They're going to kill you by night. It's a pretty scary thing. I mean, some, if, if someone came in and said, I'm a prophet of God, and they're coming to kill you, would that get your attention? Yeah. So there were some problems, however, with uh, Shemaiah's prophecy. We should say, what? Because hmm. I think Nehemiah did that. He, he was not going to take this prophecy hook, line, and sinker for a couple of reasons. He says, should such a man as I run away? I, I've been led by God. I've been su- protected and supplied by God the whole way. I've come to this place. I'm going to run away now? And God didn't tell me that. I mean, I, I know, I, I believe in prophecy and all that kind of thing, but God didn't tell me that. God told me to come and rebuild the walls. Why should I quit? And, and what such man as I, what man such as I, put in there, not a priest, could go into the temple and live. He knew that that was in the law. If you went into that place, you could, you could just die from being in the holy place if, if you're not a priest. He said, I will, I'm not going to go in there. Seems like that, that's the thing that might kill me. I'm more afraid of that. Only priests were allowed in that place. And also entering the temple in that part would desecrate it. So here's another thing. No true prophet would ask someone to violate God's law. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of times we hear prophecy and we hear people speaking about prophecy. If they're speaking something that is against God's word, that's more than a red flag. He had pronounced this prophecy against me. He figures out, <laughs> you know, uh, should, should he disobey God's word in order to gain safety from his enemies? At the least, it would undermine Nehemiah's credibility with the people and and. and uh, he was trying to unite the people. So he says, I understood. It's like, I, I got it. And saw that God had not sent him. Sometimes we just need to know that. Jesus talked a lot about f- false prophets, you know, in, in the book of Matthew, Matthew, it's recorded. He had pronounced this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. He, I don't know if somebody told him this. Uh, did Nehemiah, you know, maybe he had it revealed directly from the Lord. But the most important thing is Nehemiah knew God's word. If he's saying something that's against God's word, I know what, it's false. That didn't come from God. So he's figuring all of this out. Uh, He knew God's word and that was the confirmation. Now we get to another prayer. I love Nehemiah's prayers. Uh, They're just amazing. He just, he'll start praying. Remember Tobiah and Sambalot, oh my God, (laughs) O-M-G. According to these things that they did. Now, he doesn't pray anything bad on them. He says, just remember them for what they did, God. Then I can forget about it. And also the prophetess Noadiah, it's first we hear of her, and it's the last we hear of her, and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. So uh, apparently there was some, some scheming going on, and he basically says, I'm going to turn this all over to you. We looked at that a while back, you know, the New Testament says, uh, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Just, just leave it with me. God's a lot better at it. Think he's better at being God? Yeah, he's a lot better. The next thing we see is this marvelous victory. I mean, this push paid off. You folks have been working. 
It says in verse 15, so the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elul. Uh, in 52 days, say, wow. Say it better. Wow. I mean, it's huge. And when all our enemies heard of it, listen to this. All the nations around us were afraid. Now they're afraid. And fell greatly in their own esteem. Not such big stuff anymore, huh? Really. For they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. They got it. So they didn't have a ceremony or anything like that. The city was now safe. And it's this highest place. It's an amazing, safe place. And Nehemiah, he's not going to become king, but he is appointed governor of Judah. Uh, Some scholars think somewhere in chapter 6 is when that happened, but it could have been later. But he becomes governor. He's appointed by Artaxerxes to be governor of Judah. And he ends up staying 12 years. I think he said he was going to be there about two months. Um, but he's, he ends up staying 12 years. And he helps to negotiate peace and uh, to bring calm to the people. Well, these are the sneaky enemies that were declawed, but they're not finished. Uh, we read a little bit more that the enemy persisted in op- opposition. They, they circulated letters, uh, more of these rumor-type things. Tobiah had, a married, had, had married a daughter of one of the nobles in Judah, Tobiah. He's the guy, uh, the Ammonite from the east. So he's married one of the daughters. So he has a hook in this whole time. We realize that probably he knew everything Nehemiah did, everything Nehemiah said, uh, he was getting a direct line on that. And so he continues to send threatening letters uh, to make Nehemiah afraid. Well, I want to give you um, quickly six things that we can take away from this that I think are really important. And the first is that when you build back Boulder, you will be opposed by a sneaky enemy. Uh, You know, that Satan, I'm convinced, he never shows up with a pitchfork and a cute little costume like you would see at a a costume party. Um, He will many times use a fearful manipulation like like we're hearing in here or an attractive temptation. And the truth is that if you have not developed a walk with God that's informed by his word, you're not going to be well equipped to uh, respond to spot these things and to respond. So a question would be, how, how am I preparing for the overt attacks and also for the sneaky attacks? The second thing is, um, not every friend is really your friend. Sometimes there are frenemies. It's not to make us suspicious. Um, many enemies will appear very friendly. And sometimes it, it sounds very innocent. Let, let's have coffee and talk. But if you have kind of a check in your spirit, they, they may not have your best interest at heart. A um, friend of me uh, might say, come and let's spend a little, a little time and I'll be your friend. I'll make you feel better. Some of the worst frenemies um, offer to be your friend for a while to give you comfort. And they may have names, you know, uh, like if we're lonely or hurting or feeling neglected or inadequate. And they have names like alcohol, food. Drugs, pornography, spending, greed, the thing we go to, I'll give you comfort for a little while. Come, just for a little while. I'm I'm here. I'm so concerned for you. I want you to feel better. We need to have our our eyes open, our hearts open for that. You know, we realize more and more that seduction is a common enemy strategy, uh, even today in spycraft and espionage. The third takeaway is you don't have to respond to every request um, for your time and attention. There are many good things that will distract you from the great thing that God has appointed for you. And so I hope you'll say, I'll pray about that. And that's not a religious sounding excuse. Some, Some may use it that way. Well, I'll pray about it and they really have no intention. But it's a way of saying, it's another way of saying, I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. And we need to, to know that we're called to certain things. I love to preach. I love to teach the word of God. And so it's, it's the great work that I'm working on. And it's not that I won't go and help. I help people all the time. But I have to be careful about that. So learning to discern the guidance of the Lord is critical for us. Some people will say, um, well, listen to your gut. And I don't know. My gut rumbles a lot sometimes. <laughs> I would say we need to listen to God 
and your gut is not God. Don't make your gut God, okay? Um, we don't have to say yes uh, all the time, and we can learn to say no or wait, not now. Uh, the fourth is that godly advice uh, will not ask you to break the word of God or suggest that you break the word of God. And you have to know the word of God in order to discern these sorts of things. I was talking to a man uh, a while ago, and um, not part of even this community. He was, lived in another city, but I was talking to him, and he was kind of seeking some counsel. And he said, uh, he was in his 40s, early 40s, and he said, I'm just not connecting with my wife. I mean, we get in the car for a trip, and she puts in ear pods and opens a book, and we just don't talk, and we don't connect, connect uh, anymore the, the, the way that I would like for us to. I don't know what to do about this. And he said, well, and I talked to my mother about it, and she said, well, honey, maybe you should have an affair <laughs> and spice things up. I mean, I want to say, mom. But if you live by what's taught by the movies and the media, that sounds like a good answer, but not in God's kingdom. There's no victory there. And so we have to know the difference. If you don't know God's word, then you don't know uh, how to make those discernments and those decisions. The fifth is to stick to doing the work that God has called you to do. These walls were completed in 52 days. Um, we sometimes say it, I know in the youth ministry they say, teach keep on keeping on because I don't know if you know, you, should need, you need to pray for the students. They face things that we, I, we never faced. I mean, yes, there's some similar things, but they deal with stuff that we never deal with. It's a very, very different world. And, um, and they have to keep on keeping on. This building in 52 days, these walls, uh, when we were in Jerusalem recently, uh, we realized what a stunning project this would be. We had some people with us who work in construction with big equipment. And they said, even with modern big equipment, this looks impossible. I wouldn't take that contract a 52-day contract to build these walls, these kind of walls, really, really huge. Um, and they probably stopped to work on the Sabbath, so you're really talking about 45 days. The sixth thing that we want to take away is that opposition from the enemy does not just stop. Tobiah so kept on sending the letters. He kept on trying to intimidate Nehemiah, and there were loyalists uh, to Tobiah within Judah uh, because of those marriage and trade agreements. And so it kept on going. One of the things that we realize is that after a great victory, and this is a great victory, but after a great victory is when the enemy often comes in all the more because we kind of let our guard down. And so that's what began to happen. So let me ask this question for our, our weekend, and it's uh, how is your build going? And it might be a rebuild, but it, it may be that you're at a, a point early in life uh, working toward a future. You may be rebuilding from a disaster or rebuilding after pandemic or something like that. And the question would be, are there breaches in your walls that need to be filled in, strengthened? We've talked about doing that with the word of God and I think the cement of the spirit. That's the way we strengthen our walls. And, and what about your, what about your, your gates? Are there weaknesses in your gates, because gates are, we talked about this, what we let in and how we, how we contact, how we interact with the world. We are to be in the world, but what? Not of the world. So how do we do that? It's an important thing for us to study and to think about those weaknesses and those breaches. So let's pray together. It may be that while you were listening to this, it just came to you that you really have never begun building walls. You, you never have been taught to do that or, or, or oriented to do that. And, and now would be the time to begin building your life in God, building your life with Jesus. And, and you do that, you begin that with a simple prayer to say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I get it. I need you. And God, I pray that you would Come into my life and save me by your grace and begin this journey with me of salvation. God, I pray that you will 
You will give me all that I need and make me into the new creation. And God, strengthen these walls, build these walls, show me how the gates are supposed to work. You pray a prayer like that. You begin a great journey and I hope you'll connect with somebody to grow in that. Father, we thank you that that you show us in history, in your word, the ways that we can be strong in you and strong for you and be a community a body of Christ that honors you. In Jesus' name, amen.